Good afternoon, one and all present here. I'm Anisha, I'm your host for the day. I welcome Director Sir, Dr. B.S. Hoti and Dean Academics Ma'am Prachi Jindal to today's web talk. NSS unit of Geetharathan International Business School welcomes you all to the web talk, Air Pollution, Clean and Deliver. Geetharathan International Business School is affiliated with Guru Gobind Singh in the Prastha University, Delhi and is approved by All India Council for Technical Education, Ministry of HRD, Government of India for Technical Programs, and Bar Council of India for Law Programs. The Institute is conducting programs like postgraduate courses like MBA and MBA International Businesses, and undergraduate courses like BBA, BLLB, and BBLLB. The Institute has been rated Grade A by Academic Audit Cell of Guru Gobind Singh in the Prastha University consecutively from past five years. Gibbs has also been rated number two by Times B School Survey 2018, 2019, and 2021. The National Service Scheme is an Indian government-sponsored public service program conducted by the Department of Youth Affairs and Sports of the Government of India, popularly known as NSS. The cardinal principle of the program is that it is organized by students themselves, and both students and teachers, through their combined participation in the community service, get a sense of involvement in the task of nation building. Gibbs initiated and established the Gibbs NSS unit with the sole aim to provide hands-on experience to young students in delivering community service. Gibbs NSS unit organized various events in recent past like blood donation, social awareness, greening Delhi, each one feed one campaign, Rahat a series on health and wellness and so on. This month, Gibbs NSS unit brings to you yet another initiative that is Swachhda Pakhwada 2021. The Swachhda Pakhwada launched by Government of India is a fortnight long program observed to ensure mass participation of citizens in Swachhda activities and to truly transform Swachh Bharat into a citizens movement. With various events organized during Swachhda Pakhwada, Gibbs likes Swachhda pledge taking ceremony, slogan writing competition, cleanliness drive, poster competition. The web talk for the today is the concluding event of the initiative. Today's web talk, Air, po Air Pollution, Let's Clean and Drive, is on the invisible threat to society, air pollution. Air pollution knows no border, even in your own body. Our society needs to offer an innovative solution to analyze and clean the air in some of the most polluted parts of our cities. So today's talk will create awareness about the ways to reduce air pollution in the most innovative ways. And to present that, we have with us Mr. Vidyut Mohan, the co-founder and CEO of Takachar, a social enterprise enabling farmers to prevent open burning of their waste farm reduce and earn extra income by converting the residues into value-added chemicals like activated carbon on site. Passionate about energy excesses and supporting rural livelihoods, he became interested in biomass-based energy chemical development due to its untapped potential and close association with farmers. After initial exploration and research for his master's thesis at TU Delft, he returned to India to work with village communities in the Himalayas to convert fine needle waste into a marketable charcoal-based product. This work led him to discover a way to dram dramatically scale farm residue utilization through technology, as well as to support farm-based livelihood, which led to the formation of Takacha. In the past, he worked with Simpa Networks, where he developed pay-as-you-go solar home systems for rural households in India. Sir is echoing Green Fellow and has received various awards such as Forbes 30, Under 30, UNEP Young Campaign of the Earth 2020, JN Tata Scholarship, Dutch Royal Society of Ingenious Grant. We extend our heartiest welcome to you, sir. Delighted to have you. And now over to you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me and for that introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this uh, group today. Uh, and I would love to uh, give a flavor of uh, what to be do at Takachar and what our mission is, and would love to answer uh, questions um, even uh, either during uh, the uh, during uh, while I talk and also at the end of it. So uh, I'll pause in between if you have any questions and after that as well. Uh, I just wanted to uh, request if screen sharing is enabled uh, so that uh, this able to uh, show some slides while I talk. Uh, 
I think you can. Uh, can you try once? Yes, I'm able to do it now. All right. Great. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, it is visible. Great. So uh, before uh, we start, right? Since we are, this topic is about uh, air pollution and and waste. I just wanted to ask people in the group here, uh, what uh, uh, you know? Just a brief, a quick poll, I guess. And if people can type in their type in the chat as to what they think are the major sources of pollution in Delhi. We, there are various sources, so you can just list down whatever you whatever comes to your mind. Smoke from vehicles, yes. Factories, burning of agricultural waste, automobiles, factories. CFC gas and from refrigerators and AC, yes. Yes, that's often overlooked. So thank you for pointing that out. Household base. Chemical fumes. Okay, great. I think, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, people have shared a wide variety of uh, air pollution uh, sources, uh, open waste burning here. Uh, so uh, people have shared a wide variety of uh, air pollution sources in the city and uh, you know everything contributes to poor air quality. How about today, I'm going to talk about uh, one aspect that, uh, that is also mentioned here, that is burning of agricultural and forest waste and how that creates uh, air pollution and what we are doing at Takachar to uh, mitigate that problem. So that's, that's, uh, that's an aspect that I'll be focusing on today. So uh, Takachar is essentially into uh, harvesting value from agricultural and forest waste, uh, as I told before. And today I'm going to just give you a flavor of what we do and why we do it. As you mentioned on the poll that agricultural waste uh, is an air pollution source. And this is not just a problem restricted to uh, Northern India. Uh, or Delhi or Northern India, it's a worldwide problem where close to $120 billion per year worth of uh, agricultural and forest waste is uh, burnt in the open, uh, you know, leading to air pollution and, uh, and that leads to respiratory illnesses um, in people uh, residing close to these areas where this agricultural waste is burnt. And in fact, um, a recent study that came out is that air pollution in um, India reduces the life expectancy of people, uh, reduces the life expectancy of 40% of the population of India by nine years. So people live less by nine years, 40% of the population of India lives less by nine years because of uh, air pollution. So it's a very big problem in India. And uh, at its peak, the open burning of this agricultural waste, particularly in the months of October and November, if you only refer to the case of uh, the Northern Plains, at its peak, this um, burning contributes up to 25 to 30% of the air pollution in the city of Delhi. No, no, we know. I mean, this is a, this is a uh, situation we know that, you know, agricultural and forest waste can be used as a feedstock uh, uh, as a, you know, to many important industries. This, these can be used productively. 
right? They can be used to make solid fuel. They can be used to make fertilizers. They can be used to make uh, liquid biofuels. They can even be added to plastic additives. They can be used to make activated carbon. Many things can be done with it. Uh, and this knowledge has been ex existing for quite a few, quite a while now, for uh, you know about 20, 30 years. So why isn't this productive utilization of these residues happening? The answer lies in the nature of the residues themselves, that they are very loose, wet, and bulky. They were making it very expensive for them to transport from the farm and send it uh, to anyone who wants to use it uh, as a raw material and process it to make any of those available products that I talked about. So logistically, logistically it's very costly. And many large scale centralized units uh, that have been set, set up uh, in India, for example, to utilize this, this agricultural waste have not been able to be commercially viable uh, precisely because of its reason. It's just too expensive to transport this uh, raw material, which is so voluminous, right? So what, what this has led to is that uh, the farmer on the uh, ground has, when when he or she harvests the harvests their crop, uh, they are left with, the, with this agricultural waste on their feet, and uh, they they only have two options to deal with it. One is of course they sell it as cattle feed, right? And if they do, if they're not able to sell it as cattle feed, then they the only option is that someone to, for someone to come and take it and utilize it for any of the productive applications that I mentioned. Um, and many a times, uh, farmers are not able to sell their uh, agricultural waste or cattle feed because uh, you know the market for that is already saturated. It's uh, the supply is quite a bit, and at the same time, many agricultural wastes are not suitable to be given as cattle feed as well. For example, most of the rice straws that are burnt in Punjab and Haryana are not suitable to be fed as cattle feed. So the cheapest and fastest way for the farmer to get rid of this agricultural waste is just to burn it on the field. And, um, and, uh, 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 and of course, the farmer is not to blame for this, right? So they, they are also living their livelihood. And uh, you know, it's, it's already they live on very thin margins. So why would they invest or spend more in uh, handling their waste? So they just end, end up burning these agricultural waste on the field that not only affects the air quality in their villages, but also affects um, people living in cities as well nearby. Now, so uh, what we have done in Takachar, we, we saw this problem of uh, this agricultural waste, um, uh, you know, uh, you know there, there is a lot of potential to utilize this agricultural waste worldwide, but it's not happening. And it's not happening because uh, predominantly it's a logistics issue. So uh, what we developed was, uh, so what we thought of was that, okay, instead of transporting the waste to a large plant, why not get the waste handling equipment or the plant directly near to the waste? So what we have developed is low cost, small scale portable equipment that can be latched behind uh, tractors and taken directly to farms or to villages to process these agricultural or forest waste into uh, a carbon rich material. Uh, this carbon rich material is a valuable product, a valuable commodity product that can be used to make a wide variety of um, uh, value, valuable products such as fuels, fertilizers, uh, activated carbon, uh, raw material, etc. Right, and also this dense carbon-rich product uh, is is high in it's very high in its mass density. It's very high in its energy density. Therefore, it lowers the logistics and processing costs further down the line by up to seventy-five percent actually. Right, so it uh, it actually enables. Uh, much cheaper logistics for uh, this waste to be utilized. So, uh, 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 so this is an equipment that we saw during our pilots uh, that we deployed it in a village um, in Uttarakhand. And what we saw was when we deployed the equipment in village, 
in the village, the farmers could collect their local uh, agricultural waste and process it in, in the machine here. And they produce fuel out of it. And the farmers that were selling their waste uh, to be utilized in their machine, they, they doubled their income for the month. And secondly, the, the, the waste that was prevented from burning, so prevented air pollution from happening uh, from, that, from that particular set of waste. And also at the same time, we managed to produce uh, valuable fuel out of that uh, waste. And that fuel was used um, as, I mean, it, as a heat source for various uh, domestic as well as industrial applications uh, nearby, that, nearby that village. So we thought that this idea is uh, extremely powerful, that it has multidimensional impact. It has potential for social impact. It has potential also for environmental impact. And the decentralized and small scale nature of the equipment means that we're, that we're able to transfer the value that is generated to uh, people in villages themselves, rather than a large scale factory that requires crores and crores of upfront investment uh, that only very wealthy corporations can set up. Uh, rather than the value going to them, this, this value can directly go to uh, 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 you know, farmers in the villages or small businesses in villages themselves. Now, uh, scientifically speaking, uh, that uh, our technology uses a process known as torrefaction, which is just a fancy word for roasting of the biomass in the insufficiency of oxygen. And uh, what this leads to is it takes out all the low energy containing molecules from the agricultural waste and leaves behind all the high energy containing molecules and uh, thereby densifying the energy content of the waste. And the uh, carbon rich material that is produced uh, in the machine is, is just conveyed out and uh, stored in bags, uh, you know, and then can, it can be used for a wide variety of applications, which I'll talk about later on. And the design is, we've tried to make the design as simple and flexible as possible for people in villages to operate the machine. They just essentially have to feed in the agricultural waste from the top. It goes into the machine. It then undergoes this roasting process. And once it, once it undergoes that, it is just conveyed out through the other end uh, as shown by uh, the arrows here and then just uh, collected in the bag. Now, uh, now this, this process has, been, has existed for a lot of time, right? Charcoal production has existed for millennia. And uh, there are also many uh, companies in the past that uh, have been making charcoal from, uh, you know, have been making charcoal essentially from agricultural waste. So how is ours different? So there are traditional ways of making charcoal, of course. Uh, the most simplest way is to dig up it, put anything that you want to burn inside it and ignite it. The problem with that is it creates air pollution. And, and secondly, in order to uh, in order to um, you know, cool the charcoal produce, you have to pour in water, and that leads to um, uh, that leads to pollution of the aquifers as well. Whereas many other technologies that are available are very large scale centralized equipment. They cost crores of uh, money, uh, which are out of the reach for many rural uh, uh, players, and also at the same time uh, you know, they. Uh, uh, those those technologies take a lot of time to set up, and uh, as I talked about earlier, you require large quantities of agricultural waste to be transported to them, um, um, which is not a logistically feasible operation. So we saw this gap of having a small scale machine uh, that is uh, that is small scale enough, uh, uh, but at the same time uh, does not cause a lot of pollution that uh, some of the traditional methods um, that have been existed uh, uh, for, for a long time. So, uh, you know, our technology operates at room temperature air, uh, does not require any complicated gas handling equipment. It is 100 times lower in cost and 100 times lower in scale as compared to many other technologies. It can take, a wide, can take in a wide variety of agricultural waste. We've tested with rice husks, coconut shells, pine needles, um, um, uh, uh, walnut shells, um, almond shells, rice straws, et cetera. And we can also control the quality of the carbon rich material that is produced based on the end application. So the application could, uh, could be 
to produce fuels, the application could be to produce fertilizers, to produce activated carbon raw material. That depends on the location where the machine is based and the local context there. I'll, 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 uh, I'll stop here now. If people have any questions, then I can uh, I can answer that and uh, or discuss anything that you want to ask, and then uh, I can proceed from there. If there are any questions, uh, people may come to the chat box and we can leave it from there. Hello, is anyone asking? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a very faint voice, not able to hear properly. Okay. Students, are there any questions so you can ask? If there are any questions, you can put it up in the chat box or you can ask directly as well. Okay, so one question is here, uh, what are the main crop residues uh, you uh, cater to? So uh, the machine that has been developed, it can work with a wide variety of agricultural waste. It can uh, work with, uh, 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 you know, uh, rice straws, rice husks, coconut shells, uh, sh sugarcane trash, uh, coconut shells. So we've designed it uh, so that it can work with a wide variety of agricultural waste. So the hardware remains the same but how it processes the waste in the machine varies uh, depending on the end application that, uh, that the machine is uh, processing for. Okay, how can we at our level reduce air pollution? I think that's a great question. So we can probably discuss that at the end of the presentation because uh, we'd love to, I mean, right now we kind of zoomed in into this topic. You can zoom out a bit and then, uh, you know, uh, discuss that uh, uh, as, a, as a concluding uh, conversation. Similarly, a um, question from uh, Shelja, what should we do to increase the awareness about environmental air pollution? Yeah, great topic to discuss um, after just going through, uh, just, just after I go through the details of uh, just of what Takachar does. Okay, so I'll take one more question now, and then I can uh, continue uh, speaking. And then I can I can answer the rest of the questions just after I finish uh, speaking the rest of the slides. Um, how difficult is it to promote the idea uh, and explain it, uh, uh, explain your technology to the others? Uh, it's a um, so uh, it's it's a challenge. Uh, so but uh, you know the it's all about. Uh, so I would say in, to people who, to the users of our machine, it's very important to understand what is the value proposition that we are bringing to farmers. Why would they want to adopt, uh, adopt our machine? So it is very important to have it clear uh, in the beginning, uh, what are you designing your machine for, right? Of course, you're designing it to uh, handle all these agricultural waste and and as a result, uh, mitigate air pollution, but the machine will not be adopted by communities unless there is uh, some value proposition for them, right? Unless the machine addresses some pain point. So um, uh, uh, in, I remember in our work for one year, we didn't even focus on uh, developing the technology. We just focus on just doing interviews of farmers um, in various parts of India and other parts of the world, just to understand what is the problem that we're actually solving and what is the pain point that we're solving, who our customer is. And once you've narrowed that down, then you can tailor your message uh, accordingly. And that's the easy part, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and then you'll directly uh, strike a chord with your uh, customers or even an investor or anyone you're presenting to uh, as to, uh, you know, so that that will make sense then. But it's really important to do the hard work first of, of this customer discovery phase. Great, great, great questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll take the rest of the questions uh, after 
after going through the rest of the slides, uh, just for uh, keeping time in check. Okay. Right. So as compared to uh, open burning of these agricultural waste, we tested one of our smaller prototypes uh, in the lab. And what we saw was as compared to open burning of the agricultural waste, and, and that is similar to the image that you see on the left, uh, our technology reduces the smoke emissions by greater than 95%. Uh, which, and this is similar to you know, the, the image that you see on the right. So you now what you get essentially from uh, as an output from the machine uh, is essentially only carbon dioxide and steam. So there is no smoke emission. So these are just some, some images of a prototype. So we started with the lab prototype that you see on, see on the left. Even before the lab prototype, there were numerous other prototypes that we built just to test the market out and just try to understand the problem. Uh, so we, we tried to prototype at each stage. So we had a prototype in the beginning. Since you're business students, you just might be interested to know how we prototype to understand the market. <clears throat> so we developed a really small scale, low fidelity prototype that cost us 2000 or you know, 3000 rupees and which simulated the mach operation of the machine on a very small scale. And, uh, and, uh, on the, and that allowed us to kind of bring the product uh, to the customer within one month and test the idea out with them. And that's what that's what gave us most of the insights that we needed uh, in order to develop the functional requirements of the product and the technical specifications of the product. Then we used that to develop a lab prototype, which was a smaller scale version or a two kg per hour version uh, 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 product because uh, typically you want to first make your prototypes as small as possible. So that you're able to troubleshoot all the problems that you see on a smaller scale because it gets harder to troubleshoot as you increase the scale of the product and slowly we increase the scale of the product and we started making it more sophisticated and uh, in, in and involving more features in the machine this is the uh, latest uh, photo of the machine uh, that was taken just before we assembled it so we in each step we started uh, we we build the prototype, tested it with customers, got insights, then improve the next prototype based on those insights and trials. And in each process, we um, took the customer as uh, we put the customer at the center in a very human centered way and got inputs from them so that we make sure that we're designing according to their needs. And at the same time, we ensured that we are designing the product in such a way that it's easy to manufacture and assemble and the cost as a result uh, has a lower assembly and manufacturing cost which is uh, essentially called, called design for manufacturing and assembly and any one of you who's venturing into a hardware product business in the future i would uh, you know uh, these are some of the steps that you would uh, you would know that you would have to go through in order to uh, de-risk the development of your product and your prototype so, uh, and, and I'm happy to speak to anyone uh, offline or later as to what our learnings have been uh, through failures as well as uh, some success, right? Um, so yeah, finally we've reached a alpha level prototype version, which is a comprehensive prototype after testing various subcomponents, and are currently uh, in the process of uh, you know uh, uh, taking it out to the field uh, to test it out with uh, farmers. Now, as I talked about earlier, uh, biomass uh, and its uses are diverse. So the various kinds of agriculture and forest waste, uh, you know, rice husk, rice straws, sugar trash, coconut shells, uh, almond shells, walnut shells, etc. And uh, what our technology allows is that it allows any of these agricultural waste to be processed in our machine, and then process uh, and the processing is controlled in such a way that the quality of the output produced can be used for any of these industries or applications that, that I mentioned, be it, uh, be it activated carbon production, be it solid fuels, production of fertilizers, or other specialty carbon-based chemicals. And just to give a picture of how we envision our um, value chain to work, right? So 
imagine um, imagine i am a farmer in the village uh, right i am interested in adopting the machine i approach takachar that uh, i i i want to buy the machine i buy the machine and uh, i deploy it in the village uh, in either on my farmland or any other space that i might have i then ask small holder farmers uh, nearby to uh, sell their agricultural waste to me after harvest so i pay them say 2000 rupees per ton for uh, the rice straw that they give i and then then i collect them in my site i then process it into this carbon rich uh, material um, that is produced okay so before this carbon rich material is processed i i tell takachar that okay i want to produce fertilizers out of this agricultural waste because i see that as the most viable market and takachar does the local research and finds out yes uh, fertilizers is a viable market here and uh, we then do our r and d as to how to do this uh, how to produce the right quality of the carbon rich material that is needed to be produced to make fertilizers and uh, then we develop a intelligence which is essentially in the form of a computer program or an algorithm that tells the machine how to process this agricultural waste that has been collected by the farmer into the right quality of agri agriculture into this right quality of carbon material right so uh, the farmer what Now he or she does is he tells he tells us basically okay I want to produce fertilizers out of it, and they then just have to press a button on the machine or make a selection on the machine, and using the mobile phone network a a, a algorithm will download or just very simply put a computer program will download onto the machine that will tell the machine how to produce the right quality of this carbon rich material suitable for fertilizer application. So this fertilizer is then produced by the farmer. and uh, then it is uh, sold by the farmer uh, sold by sold by the farmer in the village to other farmers as a local business right similarly if activated carbon and is produced the farmer will press a press a different selection in the machine and a different program will download and uh, the the quality of the output will be tuned as per the activated carbon value chain and takachar will then connect the operator of the machine with the activated carbon industry who will then um buy this uh, output from the machine uh, from this uh, from from this farmer right so this market connection that we do is also big plays a big role in de-risking the adoption of the technology uh, to uh, farm groups in the area, in the area so it's just just not about the technology you have to really focus on the market and ensure there is a demand for whatever is produced from the machine otherwise it's not going to work so just to give a quick flavor of the fertilizer opportunity uh, so uh, fertilizers uh, you know are currently the currently how fertilizer produce you know it's it, they're produced in large scale centralized units for, you know factories that produce large quantities of ammonia and urea and uh, these are uh, these are essentially in many african countries for example they're not even produced there they're imported from abroad right so they're very costly in india a lot of it is imported from abroad some of it is produced in india itself but the government is subsidizing the fertilizers to significant extent and uh, i think i remember one statistic saying this government spends about 80000 crores a year on fertilizer subsidies so that is the cost that the government pays for making fertilizers affordable to farmers um, on a yearly basis right and uh, many of these fertilizers are very generic right they're not custom tuned to the crops that the farmers are growing so that they're not really effective as well and what that leads to is farmers overusing the fertilizers thereby leading to many other environmental problems that we know about so these are the, the yeah so this is what exactly what i talked talk, talked about that fertilizer production today is incompat incompatible with rural farming because fertilizer production is very large scale centralized complex one self it's all and for farmers is challenging because the, these fertilizers are expensive uh, secondly they are uncustomizable and they are very generic and that leads to overuse of fertilizers which leads to soil de soil degradation and ultimately to food insecurity right so what we envision with uh, uh, this fertilizer uh, with this fertilizer opportunity from crop residue is that we can use our technology to decentralize and downsize fertilizer production process by producing these carbon rich fertilizers from agricultural waste 
and make it feasible to produce and implement localized fertilizer production in villages themselves. It's kind of like a circular economy uh, within the village. So these are customized tailor-made fertilizers for the crops grown in village that lead to increase in crop yields, right? And uh, this is also uh, the need to increase in farmer income, both for the fertilizer users, but also for other farmers who are selling their agricultural waste to be utilized in this uh, machine. And these fertilizers are typically tuned according to the uh, pH of the soil, the moisture content of the soil, the crops grown, the nutrient deficiencies, et cetera. So we are able to mix and match accordingly and mix the fertilizer in such a way that they're custom tuned according to the crops grown there. This is a quick overview of the, you know, how the fertilizer production process is overall it takes about two hours. The agricultural waste is collected. It is converted into this carbon rich material in, the, in our machine, it is then ground to fine particles. It is then mixed with a new nutrient recipes. Uh, uh, these could be uh, compost, this could be cow dung, this could even be urea. So typically about 80% of, of the carbon rich material produced is mixed with this nutrient recipes. Uh, and uh, to produce this overall fertilizer product. And uh, if, for example, an inorganic or synthetic nutrient is mixed with the uh, mix in the fertilizer product, it, it essentially leads to 80% reduction in utilization of, say, urea or potash or any of these other chemicals as compared to the status quo. Uh, because a lot of uh, the bulk of the fertilizer is the carbon material itself. And then the fertilizer is sold by the farmer who's operating the machine to other farmers in the village itself. Uh, yeah, this typically the market is smallholder farmers whose land has been degraded and have acidic soil. I won't get into the too much details of that. I talked about how the value chain looks like as well. Um, and I can uh, talk about it in more detail if any questions uh, that arise. It's basically village, uh, for machine is based on the village. The farmer who's using a machine takes agricultural waste from other farmers in the village and pays them for that. Uh, then the operator of the machine produces the fertilizer and then uh, sells it again to farmers in the village uh, itself. So what we've seen uh, using some of our pilots is that the fertilizers that we have uh, tried using this process have increased farmer yields by 30% and thereby also increasing farmer incomes. Of course, there has been improvement in uh, 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 you know, smoke reduction as well because those agricultural waste have been prevented from burning and it improves uh, soil health as well. And of course, it creates decentralized rural livelihoods and jobs. Another application with a different biomass. So with fertilizers, uh, the, the biomass that we focus on was rice based. So rice straws or uh, rice husks. With, act, uh, with uh, act, uh, another application that I'm going to talk about now, activated carbon, uh, the, the biomass used is coconut shells uh, down south. So coconut shells is uh, essentially waste leftover in, uh, you know, uh, leftover in small scale coconut processing units uh, down south, such as coconut oil mills, right? And uh, this is coconut shells have been used to make activated carbon. Um, you might have seen the carbon filter in your water purifier at home, uh, in your in your house, in your kitchen. Uh, every year, uh, uh, you know, so you have to change that carbon filter. That carbon filter is essentially activated carbon. Uh, activated carbon is used to purify polluted air and water streams, and it starts with procurement of raw materials like coconut shells. Then in villages, uh, uh, farmers convert them into charcoal using traditional methods. This is then bought by large corporations to make activated carbon uh, filters. And this then lands up in our air purifiers at home or water purifiers at home. This is a more deep, I guess, pictorial representation of the value chain. So even coal or other fossil fuel sources are used to make um, this charred precursor or this charcoal, which is then used to make activated carbon as shown here and then it ultimately lands up in our devices um, at home. And, and it has wide application in medical industry as well, in, in power plants as well, used to remove mercury emissions, also used in mining, et cetera. So valuable industry product overall, right? And this is a typical small scale village level uh, coconut, coconut oil mill uh, that has coconut shells that is uh, you know, generated as a waste. And currently, as you can see, these coconut shells are collected and they're converted into coconut shell charcoal in these very traditional methods. Uh, <clears throat> you can see them on the image on the right. And um, as you can see, it generates a lot of smoke. 
right? And because of this, the Pollution Control Board has shut down many of these coconut shell to charcoal production units. And that, that led to a shortage of uh, raw material to make activated carbon, not only in India, but worldwide. So our solution also, so these coconut shells can be processed in a machine to make this carbon rich material in a smoke free manner and which the activated carbon industry can use as a raw material. And these farmers that were producing this uh, carbon rich material using the traditional method will not lose the livelihoods uh, <clears throat> because now they'll be able to produce the same thing in a, in a pollution uh, free manner. So, uh, right, so I mean, uh, this is uh, mostly what I had to talk about right now. I talked about activated carbon and fertilizers as our first uh, applications, but overall our at, at scale vision is to serve uh, biomass generators and consumers worldwide. So using our equipment, uh, mitigate close to 700 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions and about 75,000 tons of uh, particulate matter emissions by 2030. So this would mean catering to the markets of not only fertilizer production and activated carbon, but also making solid fuels, liquid biofuels, and other specialty chemicals in the future. Um, yeah, thank you so much for listening in and uh, would love to, love to. Um, uh, thank love you so much, sir. You are truly an epitome of knowledge. It was extremely valuable to be the part of this session. Um, sir, may I have your permission to take up a few questions from our audience? Would like to be answered? Sure, sure. So if anybody has any kind of question, they can drop in the chat box. And also there is a form in the chat box. And please kindly fill the form for your participation certificate. So uh, if, uh, so I'm trying to remember where I stopped last time. Um, Okay. Um, so, what sh I th I th what should we do to increase envi uh, environmental awareness uh, uh, about pollution? I think that's a great uh, overarching uh, question, and uh, I mean there there are um, no single no right answer to this. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, I I would love to kind of open this question up to the. Uh, to the students as to what they think, uh, you know, they can do on an individual basis. So I don't want to talk about uh, generally, you know, solving big problem and then, you know, with, you know, coming up with a startup to solve it. That will be great, of course. But all of us can, I think, do something on an individual basis ourselves in our daily lives as to how we lead our lives, um, you know. Uh, so essentially prioritizing needs over wants. Uh, so I would, I mean, I would encourage everyone to think on how they could do, incorporate uh, their lifestyle, how they could lead their lives in such a way that you generate minimum waste, give off minimum pollution um, in your day-to-day -day living. And and uh, some of the things I do, for example, is that um, I mean, I I still don't have a car. I still take public transport uh, wherever I go. I I. Um, I don't buy things uh, till I absolutely need it, till, till it is absolutely needed, right? So prioritizing needs over wants, so that reduces a lot of the plastic waste or other things that are generated that ends up in landfills and gets burnt and causes the causes smoke emissions uh, uh, in response to that, right? And uh, I keep reusing things. So I keep reusing clothes that are still really old, right? So I don't, uh, I don't throw away old clothes. I try to reuse them as much as possible. So these are some of the things I do. Would love to know from the audience here as to uh, what some of you think uh, you all could do or are doing to uh, tackle this on an individual basis. Is there anyone who would like to respond to this question asked by Vidyut sir? what you are doing uh, to reduce uh, air pollution or pollution overall? Anyone? Carpooling for sure, that's good. 
yes more use of the public transport i think that what i also prefer doing if i have to tell you from my side what about others reuse and reuse creating a green environment at least around myself like around my surroundings so that at least i can initiate something great great yeah i see some interesting answers here and overall i mean I, there could be various ways you could do that and a simple philosophy i i follow that uh, that uh, that might uh, resonate with you as well is uh, we i mean we're always faced with a choice uh, at one point as to say when we are when we when we are when we are in requirements of something right say suppose i have to buy uh, a new laptop or a new suppose i have to i'm in need of a new phone i see a new phone and add for a new phone uh it's in the latest iphone uh, that is soon coming for example right and i see that my phone is uh, 3 years old um i am compelled to buy it because i think okay the iphone is really cool looks really nice really new features etc but do i really need to buy that iphone uh, why do i need to buy that iphone uh, is it just because it has more features uh, right it does because it has looks just because it looks good right so you're faced with a question at that point as whether you can continue your life with the existing phone that you have uh, then buying that buying a new phone even if your phone is older but is still able to do the job for you right so that is essentially what prioritizing needs over wants is and uh, i mean it, it it's a, it, you need to make it clear in your mind act, actually what if this is actually really needed in your life uh, to uh, you know get you going make you productive or is it something you know it's a good to have and you're buying so uh, uh, that's a question that should always come up before you're making any purchase decision uh, uh, and that's a fundamental to sustainability uh, and that, that that's how i would define sustainability as so there is a question from harsh mehta i also found very eye catching that is what can be the possible solution uh, for the village people who tend to burn cow dung for cooking their meals and hence leading to the pollution as well um sure uh, cow dung is actually a great uh, source of uh, i mean cow i mean cow dung of course uh, Uh, you know, can be used uh, to make compost, uh, so that it can be directly used as a, a fertilizer substrate. It can be directly used on the farm, so that is one direct application, of course. And that cow dung at the same time uh, can be used in biogas plants because it it, it can produce uh, and you can get biogas for cooking from that. But also you can get a good uh, fertilizer as an output from those biogas plants as well. So. compost uh, the, the cow dung can be used for you know in in uh, in various applications so there is also a question from kanza kazmi we all know the farmers unknowingly contribute towards pop pollution through their activities so how do you spread awareness amongst those farmers who are unaware of the practices farmers are actually the most aware people they already they they, they do this uh, the, as part of their livelihoods right and they know it's bad for not only uh, them uh, but their families but also us they know about it but what they are looking for are opportunities uh, to address this problem right and they are also constrained uh, there are various equipments available in at the village level to handle these agricultural wastes that can there are mulches available there are um, happy seeders i mean these are some of the equipments that are talked about that bury these agricultural waste into the soil so there are these equipments available so some farmers some wealthier farmers are able to afford these equipment and pay the extra cost to rent them and handle these agricultural waste but other smaller farmers who have smaller land holdings if they if they use this equipment then they are paying another say 1500 rupees an acre to handle these agricultural waste 
and this cuts down on their margin or the profit that they own uh, that they earn while selling their crops. So you know it's so th that's why this, this disincentivizes them to adopt these equipment. So one has to come up with incentives for farmers to uh, not burn their agricultural waste and provide solutions at the village level itself to for them to quickly get their waste off the field and utilize it. So it cannot be a cost to them. It has to, it has to be uh, taken up out of their field at, uh, at no cost, or at least it should be some income, at least it should be income generating for them. That's what I feel. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, there is also a question from Hiteen Chadda that in the rising age of automobiles, do you think that the introduction of electric vehicles can be the optimal solution to remove the air pollution? Uh, electric vehicles, uh, uh, electric vehicles, of course, uh, uh, lead to electrification of uh, uh, many of these um, uh, many of these uh, applications uh, uh, in uh, mobility, right? Uh, so either in vehicles, scooters, auto rickshaws, and um, and even trucks. So it provides us as a, it provides us an opportunity to in two ways. A, it increases the efficiency of these vehicles. So these vehicles are highly efficient, energy efficient. And secondly, it transports the energy burden for these vehicles onto the grid, right? So, uh, so now the emissions that were not coming out from your, from the tailpipe of your car are now coming out from the smokestack of a power plant. And in India, where say 60% of your electricity is still from generated from fossil fuel sources or um, coal and natural gas power plants, uh, a proportion of that uh, energy generation, excess energy that is now needed to be generated to cater to the needs of uh, electric vehicles will come from these uh, fossil fuel sources. So essentially the pollution load will be transferred to another source, uh, right? Uh, but uh, this prepares us for the future that as we slowly trans transition to a cleaner renewable economy and as we generate electricity through renewable energy, those coal power plants will be shut down and all our uh, electric vehicles will be run on uh, cleaner sources of power. But at the moment, uh, it's, go it's uh, going to substantially shift the energy burden onto uh, fossil fuel sources right now. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, there is one more question from Shelja. She says that volcanic eruptions are a huge alarm for concern for human life. What measures can be taken to prevent the disastrous aftermath and cause of onto our air? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm qualified enough to answer that question regarding uh, volcanic eruptions. So, um, well, volcanic eruptions are a natural cycle. I mean, we can't really do uh, I mean, I don't think we can do much about that, right? Um, they are going to happen. Uh, what we can do is, I mean, we can um, we can uh, uh, on on our level we can plan better and not have human habitations close to volcanic eruption volcanic sites. Uh, that can be a threat to human habitations because of not only. Uh, uh, you know, the hot, uh, uh, the hot ash that is emitted from these volcanoes, but also the smoke that comes from them. But uh, yeah, I don't think we can do anything about volcanic eruptions as such. Uh, that's uh, out of our control. Thank you so much, sir. Just one last question from Shruti Kejriwal, that uh, industrial emission is one of the prime cause of air pollution, yet big corporate giants get away with that very easily. What, according to you, could be the possible solution? Um, well, uh, big corporate giants uh, get away from that. So, I mean, the, the solution to this is not technical in nature. The solution to this is um, uh, political in nature uh, and uh, also depends on civil society because, uh, I mean, technology has been existing. Many of the world's pollution problems can be solved by existing technology that has been existed for decades, but it's still not happening. So unless um, we are able to uh, raise our voice against um, these industrial houses, they'll continue to 
uh, they'll continue to operate in this way, right? And this is a very complex problem with the pollution control board and corruptions, corruption in the pollution control board, for example. Uh, and also, uh, you know, that enables these corporations to operate in such a way. Uh, so uh, if we see this happening, we have to raise our voice as citizens and uh, go to our politicians and, you know, uh, uh, make our democracy work. So that's how it's going to happen. No technical solution is going to fix this. Thank you very much, sir, for clearing our doubts with such ease and fineness. Although this questionnaire session can go for a long, but due to time restriction, I must conclude the session right here. Now I would welcome Muskan, ma'am, to extend the vote of thanks. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. I hope I'm audible to all. Uh, I, Muskan Grover, take this opportunity to express my gratitude towards our honorable chairman, sir, Sri Arun Jindal, sir, and vice chairman, sir, Sri Anirudh Jindal, sir, for their constant support. A very special thanks to our academic dean, Ms. Prachi Jindal, ma'am, for her guidance and her encouragement and her constant support throughout. I would like to thank Director, sir, Professor B.S. Hoti for his guidance. I, on behalf of Gita Ratan International Business School and the entire team of NSS unit, and on my own behalf, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to the resource person of this web talk, Mr. Vidyut Mohan, who is a co-founder and CEO of Takachar, Echoing Green Fellow, Forbes Under 30, 30 Under 30, UNEP Young Champion of the Earth 2020, for sharing his words of wisdom with us. A big thank you for your efforts towards enabling farmers to prevent open burning of their waste farm reduce and earn extra income by converting the residues into value added chemicals like activated carbon on site, your efforts towards reduction in air pollution and mitigate climate change. We are all inspired by your great words, sir. Thank you so much for joining and thank you. Uh, we would like to have more associations with you in future. Thank you all. Over to you, Manusha. Thank you so much for inviting me. I thank our honorable guest speaker, Mr. Vidyut, for sparing his precious time. Hope your words of value are a life changer for many. Thank you, sir, and all who were present here. Have a nice day. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you all.